I'm Carol Danielle White. Um, I'm wrapping up my master's degree in education. This is my second year in the English education program. I graduated undergrad in 2010 with an English degree here at Virginia Tech. And I just loved it so much I had to come back. I'd like to begin my portfolio with a quote from John Dewey. Um, John Dewey says that education is a social process. Education is growth. Education is not a preparation for life. Education <coughs> is life itself. And this is a quote I came across actually in my high school career. Um, it's something that really spoke to me about how I felt about my personal learning. And that I really wanted to be a lifelong learner and I didn't want school to the extent of my education. And going into teaching, that's something I really want to instill in my students. That yes, even though I'm a teacher, technically education is my life. But even if I wasn't, I'd always be learning. And I want them to have that love of learning, no matter what it is they're learning, even if it's not my subject. Beginning the program, I wasn't exactly sure what I believed. I jumped into um, my content classes in the fall of 2010, but I never really had methods classes until last fall. And so I knew a little bit about what I was teaching. I had delved into how to teach grammar. I had delved into um, content reading. But I hadn't really done any of the how to make a lesson plan or what pedagogically is really best practice. And so last fall when I began my methods course, I um, was asked to create a this I believe statement. And summing up what I thought I believed then was that teachers have the power to influence students. The line between being a teacher and a friend is, <coughs> is very fine and that all students want to learn, just not always what the teacher wants to teach. <laughs> Going into my fall placement, I was in eighth grade, and my eighth graders were absolutely wonderful. I thought I wanted to teach high school. I thought I liked that developmental group, but being with the eighth graders I had in this fall, I completely changed my mind. Um, I still think high school would be a good fit for me, but I would not at all be opposed to being in, second, in lower secondary now. Um, my teachers respond. My students responded very well to me as a teacher. They loved the individual attention I was able to give them. They loved the personal interaction that I really tried to incorporate. But they, um, and and they were just pretty much all around pleasant. We had some minor behavioral issues, but nothing compared to what I experienced this spring. And although at the time I was horrified by the behavioral issues. Now, I'm thinking it really wasn't that bad. It was kids being kids, and everybody goes through developmental stages where sometimes they act out a little bit. That said, this spring, I did have 12th graders. Second semester, college track, and I was coming in during their second semester. They had already established themselves as students. They had already grown to know their place at the school. And I was this outsider coming in and thinking I knew everything. And on top of that, I didn't have a period to grow into the school. Because my cooperating teacher also taught two dual enrollment classes, I was only able to teach three periods every day. And that really limited my hours, the, uh, uh, the number of hours I was allowed to spend in front of a classroom during the semester. So I began day one with full control of the class. I didn't get that warming up period, and honestly, I completely started it off on the wrong foot. I came in. I did a little bit of getting to know the students on my first day, and then day two, I was straight rigorously into what I was supposed to be teaching them. And they rebelled. They hated it, and they hated me. And so I had to do a little bit of backpedaling, start over again. Um, and, but even though I had this negative experience, I think it really helped me grow as a teacher that I was able to stop and reflect on what I was doing wrong and reflect on what the students actually needed from me. And that allowed me to, um, it, it allowed me to make changes based on what I was seeing in myself and what I was seeing in the students. And that's really something that Dr. Dredger has urged us to do, is to look at what we're doing and <coughs> find ways to adapt it based on what's needed. Um, the way what I believe has changed because of this spring semester isn't that I don't think kids can do it, isn't that I don't think I have the ability to reach them, isn't that I'm not sure that they want to learn what I want them to learn, 
But mostly the way it's changed is that all of those things are still true, but in surprising ways. That I need to remember that being fully invested in my students isn't always enough. I do need to adapt to their needs. And I need to remember that even when I have one student who's established himself as the class sleeper, he can still come to me at the end of the semester with an independent reading assignment that absolutely blows my mind away. It was beautiful, it was artistic, and he was so into explaining every detail that he incorporated into his painting. And I need to remember as a teacher to allow that student to surprise me and to not get hooked into the routine and ex expecting that just because that's the way the student has always behaved, that's the way it's going to continue. Unpacking my practice, like I said, reflection has been a big part of what I'm doing this year and what I plan to do in the rest of my teaching career. And one of the things that I've really noticed from unpacking my practice over the past two semesters is that at the beginning, in my very first hook lesson in front of my cohorts, I was so nervous. I had all these little nervous tics. I did things like bite my lips. I kind of squirmed. I stood and looked at the clock and fidgeted. And in my reflection, that was the only thing I could think about. I sat there at my computer and belittled every little thing about me and about how uncomfortable I was in front of the classroom, but I didn't touch on the practice at all. I didn't talk about the lesson. I didn't talk about the pedagogy. I didn't talk about how I was going to fix what my students were learning. I talked about me. And going through the rest of my reflections, I realized how immensely that changed. Um, that by the end of my practice this spring, I feel much more comfortable. And I know that going in. And even though I don't look like it right now, it's really hot outside, but I'm comfortable here. That This really is where I belong, and I've grown into a teacher. And I was then able to look at what my students were learning, to look at my informal assessment, and to adapt my lesson on the spot based on what my students needed from me. did an action research project in replacement. Um, similarly to how I felt about my reflection, to how I felt about teaching, that uncomfortableness and that inability to get past my mannerisms and how I was feeling into the content, I was the same way with technology. I was really scared to bring technology into my classroom because I wasn't sure that I had a hold on the information. I wasn't sure that I could introduce technology and then be able to address my students' concerns with it and the problems that students encountered. And so that made this action research project really a struggle for me, where I was told you have to incorporate technology, you have to research it, and you have to be able to put together this paper. And I thought, oh my goodness, what if my technology is horrible and I'm no good at this and it's going to turn out horribly? And my grade's going to suffer and I might not graduate. And really, I had nothing to worry about. What I chose to use was poll everywhere. And <coughs> it worked phenomenally. I spent a couple of days before I was implementing into the classroom playing around with it online. I read some of the FAQs. I watched some of the tutorials. I did a couple practice quizzes for myself where I texted in, and then I asked my roommate to text in. And I really managed to get most of the bugs out of my system so that if the, when the students encountered it, I was able to fix it. And as far as how action research really affected my students, they were coming into class every day and wanted to know what the poll was going to be. They wanted to talk about what poll answers they had given the day before. Even some of my least engaged students were excited and walked in the door and said, hey, Miss White, look, I have my cell phone, let's go today. And then they wanted to talk about the subject matter when previously they would sit in their groups and talk about where they went for dinner the night before or who was going to prom. <laughs> <clears throat> and having that success in my action research project really made me much more comfortable with technology. And now, instead of wondering, oh my goodness, how am I going to incorporate this, 
I put together a James screencast about how I came into the program understanding technology and what I want to do with it now. And even just the fact that I used Jing, it took me 15 minutes, I worked out some of the bugs, I went in, I uploaded it to screencast.com, and it was easy. And I now feel much more comfortable with my ability to use that in my classroom and to help my students understand their learning through these technology ways. which were hugely beneficial in the fall. But, especially with student teaching every day, we really made use of Facebook and um, Twitter and WordPress and other social networking sites like that to keep in touch even when we couldn't be in the classroom together. And having that type of community and knowing that if I had a question about one of our assignments or about a way to engage Johnny who was having a bad day, I. It was really comforting to know that I could come to them. I could post a question and say, you know, hey, what do you think about this? And within 20 minutes, I would have responses. And being able to be that technologically checked in with my community practice really helped me grow and really helped me be the best teacher for my students. I've also used a huge number of teaching texts. This is just my texts from two semesters with one or two extras thrown in from the semester before. It's very overwhelming. And I have read at least half of every single one of them. And I've gotten to a point where I don't have to read the whole book to get the idea that I need for that, for that question. I can remember that, for instance, When Kids Can't Read is a book that's about helping kids read helping get engage kids in reading. And so if I'm having trouble with one student who really is having a hard time getting into a book, really is having a hard time choosing a book, I can turn to that book, flip through the table of contents, and find exactly what I'm looking for. And that makes me much more confident in my practice. It makes me much more confident in my ability to have the information that I need when I need it to help my students. Um, the variety of this... <coughs> The variety of this community of practice, including the authors in the novels, but also including authors that I interacted with on names about their actual books, where they were able to clarify questions and they were able to reaffirm ideas that I had. That I could say, when I read this chapter of yours, this is what I got out of it. And the author himself could say to me, yes, that's exactly what I wanted you to see. Makes me much more confident in what I'm doing as a teacher. And that type of collaboration is exactly what I think every teacher needs. I think no individual tool can ever be as important as using collaboration and being able to use my peers, my cohort, um, everybody else in the education world as my tools. That by working together we can all take what we're doing and adapt it to exactly what we need from it. And one way that I've chosen to do that is through jigsaw assignments in my classroom. Um, the, the unit plan that I did was on romanticism and Frankenstein. And Actually, creating this unit plan was a bit of a challenge for me because, like I said, I started teaching on day one. So I was in the middle of teaching the unit on the best <coughs> when I was planning my Frankenstein unit. And this unit is adapted from, or this lesson, the Jigsaw lesson, is adapted from Jigsaws from 50 Instructional Routines to Develop Content Literacy by Fisher, Brozo, Frey, and Ivy. And the idea behind this lesson, the way they wrote it, is that you take a large chunk of information and you break it into pieces for the students. 
And so instead of asking every student to be a master of every piece of the, the, of the information, you break the students in groups, and group one is responsible for section one, and group two is responsible for section two. But then they have home groups. So one person from group one, and one person from group two, and one person from group three, and one person from group four, all go together to form group A, where they then share the information that they found with the rest of their group. I adapted this lesson slightly, because that amount of movement was too much for some of my students. <coughs> I mentioned we had some behavioral issues, and the movement was just, it was a lot, it took a lot of time, and it was really an opportunity for the students to misbehave, to get on track. And so, in order to keep us on our, my lesson plan, in the timeline that we had, instead of switching back to home groups, what I did was I had group one stand up and present their findings to the class. And this also allowed me to use a, very, a lot of different forms of assessment in this lesson. I was able to um, informally assess them within their group discussions. I was able to formally assess them when they handed in their worksheets. And I was able to informally assess them and correct any misconceptions or add any more pertinent information that they might have lost while they were presenting to their, to their peers. So it really provided a great opportunity for me to take this theory and adapt it to my students and really make it work so that they came out of the lesson with all the information I wanted them to have. <coughs> when we get back. Can you go? Click on the other tab, Google Sites. I began lessons with a mixture of images and oral lecturing, I suppose. Um, this is an image of the monster Frankenstein drawn as closely to the way he is actually depicted in the book as I could find. And because <coughs> an item like that allowed us to get into a discussion of how the Frankenstein that we know was created. And the characterization that Jack Pierce, the makeup artist, chose to make the Frankenstein from the 1931 movie. And we compared that to the original description in the text. Um, that enabled them to engage with the text that can be kind of overwhelming and is so completely different from what they know. But it allowed them to use their prior knowledge and to engage that and use that to interact with what we were learning. That instead of just saying this is different, I can't understand it, they could see exactly why it was different and exactly how it was different. And relate it to what they, what they were doing, what they had known before. We then would move into a brief thinking activity where we would pair a question from a previous discussion with specific quotes from what was going on. Um, and then we would move into read aloud, straight from a lecture to a discussion to a read aloud, where we would then address a new idea in the previous night's section for homework. And then I wrapped up this discussion with another different type of a text, a map. In the section that we had read for this day, Victor Frankenstein takes this huge travel through Europe while he's procrastinating. And I really wanted them to be able to see that this wasn't some daily jaunt out in the country. This really was a weeks-long travel all through Europe while he was 
trying to get up the guts to make his next creation. And they engaged really well with that. They really liked being able to see what was happening in the book, being able to see where the different movement was, being able to see a, a different day when we were talking about um, one of the mountains. I pulled out a picture of the mountain and talked about the glacial ice caps on this mountain and how all of that interacts with what Mary Shelley was trying to tell us in the book. And they responded very positively to that kind of a lesson that really presented the information in a way they could interact with and, um, and just made it engaging for them and still kept it on track. I still got to teach what the standards tell us is important, but I got to stray from it just enough to get this interesting information in there. Because really the standards to me are more of just guidelines. They, actually on my standards page, I have a quote that I love by Yogi Berra. If you don't know where you're going, you might end up someplace else. And for me, that's how the standards help guide my classroom. They show me, this is where you want to end up. This is what you want your students to accomplish. Now go and use your imagination to find a way to get them there. So in all, I think you can see that I've come a long way since spring of 2010 when I was graduating undergraduate. Um, I know I'm not done learning yet. I do want to be a lifelong learner, and that's my goal. But I think my growth so far shows that I have the skills that I need to continue that. I have the reflection skills, and my community of practice will always be able to support me in my content, my knowledge, my growth, and my learning. Thank you. <laughs>